Hi, Steve Van Meter here, and welcome to your Wednesday night premiere, where we take about 15 minutes every Monday and Wednesday night to try to make sense of markets that really don't make a whole lot of sense. But tonight, we're going to play catch up from Monday since the bond market was closed. Really, anything that happens in the stock market magically just gets undone the next day. So we're going to play catch up from Monday, and I've got some really cool stuff for you Friday. I, I really can't wait to show it to you, but I'm going to hold back. We're going to do that on Friday. And we're going to try to look objectively, are stocks cheaper or bonds cheaper? And you know, where where do you go with your money? You know, we're in a 10-year expansion. Stock market has been up. It continually trades higher on trade news or lack of trade news or even negative trade news as if there's so much pent-up demand over the last two years that consumers are just dying for the green light on this trade deal. So they can go buy new homes and cars and electronics and cell phones. I don't think so, but that's what the market's trying to tell you. So we're going to dig in some data today, try to figure out, you know, we got retail sales coming. We got uh, Friday, we got producer price index tomorrow. Let's see if we can predict what's going to happen. The content of this video is provided as educational information only. It's not intended to provide investment or other advice. It is not to be construed as a recommendation or solicitation by our selling security financial product instrument or to participate in any particular trading strategy. This video was paired by Steve Van Meter in my own personal capacity. Please express the video that I do not reflect the view of Atlas Financial Advisors, Inc. or Steve Van Meter Financial. So this week, we found out that India, their industrial production contracted. And you might say, ah, well, what's really the big deal? Well, excluding China, because we don't know what data is true or not, the U.S., Germany, United Kingdom, Japan, all have contracting industrial production. Now we have India. Why does India matter? It's because it's the fifth largest economy, again, if we pull China out of all this, in the world. So now you have the big five, and we saw this chart once before, because I don't have all uh, the data to do the other, other than the U.S., because it's provided by the Fed. I don't have the other data. But you can see when industrial production of the big four contracts, you're heading into a recession. Maybe we're having one here because they're all contracting. We'll get U.S. industrial production uh, later this month, and I'll predict that it's going to further contract. But now you have India. So you have effectively the global economy from a manufacturing base contracting, and yet people are bullish about stocks. They really truly believe that somehow this trade war is going to end and so many people are just dying to spend money. You, know, you can go back and look at periods during like World War II where a lot of American families couldn't spend any money because they were required you know, to save and anything excess needed to go to war effort. So what happened during World War II is families paid down debt and build up their, built up their savings. When the war ended, all of a sudden demand <laughs> took off because people had cash. Today, that isn't the case, but that's what the markets are telling you. So let's go look at some charts and then we'll kind of backfill into uh, uh, Monday. Take a look at how hedge funds managers are positioned and see who is overvalued and who is not. Now, this is the manufacturer's new orders of durable goods. So these are your large goods, things that people buy that they don't plan on replacing, like refrigerator. Well, they don't plan on replacing them right away. Refrigerators, rush and dryers, large items that are going to be more expensive. And that is in blue on a year-over-year -year basis. It is contracting. So what this tells you, is that orders, new orders for large durable goods is less than it was a year ago. In fact, it's been less than it was a year ago for several months. And you can see with the shaded areas being recessions that when new orders fall and contract, it usually is an ominous sign for the economy. Now, I've overlaid consume, the consumer price index, which came out today. Uh, I do want to come on, comment on that briefly to say that while consumer prices rose, I want to say 2.3%, what is on a year over year basis, what is more concerning to me is inflation adjusted wages only are rising at 1.2%. So that means workers wages are not keeping up with inflation. And that may kind of tell us that 
why there's still a demand for cash, uh, refinances. And the best data we have on cash out is like two years old because it's really old data, but it's just is what you get. The 60 some percent of all refis are cash out. Now what people are doing with that cash, I don't know, are they living on it, paying off debt? I don't know. But the fact that wages are not keeping up with inflation is a problem. So today we see that Consumer price index came in. Now, th this is um, not excluding, or this is all items. Okay, so the one excluding of uh, food and energy was actually higher at 2.3%. But anyways, here you can see came in at uh, just shy of 1.8, just under the Fed's 2% target. And, yeah, oddly enough, there's a line there at 2%. And there is manufacturer's goods dur or durable new orders of durable goods and what does that tell you kind of just looking back at this long term is that what direction is inflation likely to go now it's likely to go lower but there's a problem people believe that this spike like we saw here in 2007 2008 is going to happen and so when it comes to investor positioning when inflation tells you to buy stocks, sell bonds or short bonds if you're a speculator, and that's your position and buy oil. So think of that's kind of what you would be thinking because the market truly believes we're going to have an inflation spike. Now the question is, are we really going to have that? Well, let's go look at the next chart where I've overlaid 10-year treasury yields and you can see there's a long-term relationship where when treasury yields fall, because it indicates tighter financial conditions that consumer prices fall. And you can see consumer prices in red, 10-year treasury yields in blue. And that suggests here that consumer prices, you can see in the short term looking at a 10-year period, that consumer prices are, or the growth of consumer prices is likely to head lower. But that's not what people are all excited about. Why the market perceives this inflation is coming is because of this chart right here. So when you talk about inflation, what are the biggest components of the consumer price index? Housing, medical, energy. So as educated investors, are housing prices volatile normally? Not really. How about medical expenses? Not really. I mean, yeah, they, they move, but they're not volatile. How about energy prices? How about crude oil specifically? Oh yeah, very, very volatile. And when you think about crude oil, what goes into almost everything we use? I mean, even you can say, well, that mug you have there that's shaped like an oil barrel, there's probably no actual oil made in it. It's, it's you know, ceramic mug. Okay, I'll give you that. But how did the stuff get to the factory? How did the equipment that made that mug, was it greased? Did it have oil? You bet. Was there a power plant somewhere that fueled that electricity to the plant? Yes, so oil is in everything. So when oil prices go up, inflation tends to rise as well. And what you can see back here between 2007 and 2008 was a spike in crude oil in blue, and that drove consumer prices higher. So now we're over here, whoops, we're over here, do you see a spike in crude oil? No. So the notion that we're going to have this big spike of inflation coming, and that's why investors are positioned the way they are, is not true. The only way we could get this big spike in crude oil, if there was, say, a lack of supply, there isn't, or there was a lack of inventory, there isn't. So it's unlikely we'll see consumer prices rise, meaning potential investors are mispositioned. Now let's look at producer price index. This is what manufacturers pay. And you can see that producer prices are contracting. That's not being passed through to you and I as consumers, but it means that producers are paying less for their inputs than they were a year ago. And when producer prices fall, well, you can guess what is going to eventually happen to consumer prices. And you can look at manufacturers' new orders of durable goods and say, wow, what a nice relationship. When new orders start to fall, well, lo and behold, input prices tend to fall. And it's a simple supply and demand issue. If I'm a business and I manufacture, say, washers and dryers, 
and I'm, you know, running projections, which most companies run projections like, you know, a lot. Hey, look, we're going to sell all this, all this new product. We better build a whole bunch of it. So I hire some employees and buy a bunch of raw materials and I load up on washer and dryers. Well, when new orders start to fall, what's my problem? Well, one, I'm going to cut what I'm ordering, right? I'm going to go to my supplier and say, hey, I don't need whatever the stuff I needed to build these. And then I'm gonna to have to face lowering my prices, hence, you know, you see consumer prices fall to move my inventory. So as fewer businesses are ordering raw materials, price of raw materials falls. And that makes sense when we look at the producer price index. And on Friday, we have retail sales. And retail sales has a pretty good relationship with durable goods, new orders. Well, that makes perfect sense because, well, if people aren't buying as much stuff, what do retailers and wholesalers do? They lower prices. So when we look and we see there's a bit of an anomaly here where retail sales has been growing around 4% a year and durable goods new orders are falling at a rate of minus 5.54%. Jeez, that's a lot. Uh, anyways, so you look at that discrepancy and, and what could be going on here is there's a lot more inventory in the channel than people believe. There are huge amounts of inventory and companies are not talking about that during their earnings. I mean, you hear things like the Port of Los Angeles, not only is the port full, their warehouses at the port are full because the warehouses of the companies who are importing the stuff, they're full and their stores are full. I mean, I read today that Fiat Chrysler is trying to push 40,000 new vehicles into its dealership network and the dealers don't want it. Again, too much inventory. So companies are constantly trying to find ways to hide this stuff off of their books. So this makes perfect sense. And when you have these anomalies where durable goods is headed down and retail sales is rising, you can guess where retail sales is going because obviously it tells you that if a retailer is not selling them, they're gonna cut their orders to the wholesaler. And if enough retailers cut their orders to wholesalers, wholesalers cut their orders and it dominoes down the supply chain because it tells you that retail sales are going down. Now, does it mean we're gonna see a sharp drop on Friday? I don't know. It just gives you a good idea of what is coming. All right, so let's go take a look at how hedge fund managers are positioned. And when we get to the crude oil one, let's be a little objective about what we're looking at. So what we have now seen is as of last week, no surprise, hedge fund managers are chasing this move higher because again, they totally believe that inflation is coming. Everyone is looking back at their charts of 2007 and 2008. They're not overlaying oil. And even if they are, they're going to be mispositioned on that because there's so much supply in the oil market. So is it a surprise that you have algorithmic computer selling based on fake news, then quant computer selling based on the fake news of the, of the algos who, who move the market enough to trigger selling of the quant. And then you have hedge fund managers who say, hey, why not? I'll join in the fray because finally inflation is going higher and that means interest rates are going up. So again, you see this move short here. What we found out today, uh, what we already know is the algos moved on fake news. So that doesn't help. The quant computers are pretty much done selling, meaning there's be an opportunity for people to buy into bond market and push those quants back in at a higher level. I expect that to happen. And an opportunity to squeeze these hedge fund managers who are chasing the fray. And you can see the currently net short was 231,000, up 115, huge net short increase. And keep in mind, interest rates do not bottom until hedge fund managers, speculators are long. Here we have 30 year, no surprise, they increased their nut short more than 50, more than 100%. They went uh, from 31 uh, or up 31,000. So they were at uh, what, 23,000? Big increase, over 100%. Again, shorting the 30 year bond, even though we know based on the real estate data, there isn't much demand. In fact, uh, looking at the weekly mortgage data, it says, that demand for mortgages is roughly flat since July. So there's no increase in demand here that is substantiating higher interest rates. But again, these are all people who are speculators, either computer models or they're speculators who do not care about the facts, they care about the trend. Now let's look at crude oil. And you can see these are very long positions by the hedge fund managers. So stop and think for a second, if these hedge fund managers unwound their positions back down, how low would crude oil go? 
And if crude oil fell, okay, now that you see the relationship between crude oil and consumer prices, what would that mean to cons the consumer price index? Well, it will go down. And what would that mean for treasury yields? Would go down. So what you're seeing here is the hedge fund managers are artificially propping up crude oil to, to play their inflation narrative because they believe that's happening. But at some point, we're going to keep seeing these build week after week. Now, why are we going to see crude oil build? Now, I'm sure there's some weeks we're not, but overall, we're going to see more builds than draws. Well, you, do, you just saw that. Five major industrial countries all have contracting industrial production. So if you're a manufacturer of industrial goods, you don't need as much oil when you are selling fewer things. And we see that in the durable goods orders and all and whatnot. So that tells us that these long position oils are going to get unwound at some point, lead to lower inflation, lower treasury yields. All right, let's move along. Uh, hedge funds are uh, pushing their lungs on the S&P. No surprise. Uh, they're pushing their lungs on gold. Again, it's interesting because when you get these long positions in gold, it, it's going to get unwound. That will be where you find the, the next bull market in gold is the bottom, wherever this thing bottoms somewhere down here, because you'll have flushed out all the speculative positions. And that means the smart money will have bought for more than five years in. They will have been buying all the way through here and they will hold all the cards. So this is the final move out and you can see it rolling over despite hedge fund managers being long. Uh, they've increased their long slightly on the NASDAQ and are backing off their short positions on uh, small caps for Russell 2000s and backing off their US dollar shorts, which is actually bullish for bonds, even though they're not a direct correlation. But think about this, when currencies get weak, what tends to happen? Inflation. So when currencies get stronger, you get disinflation. So rising dollar does support a lower interest rates. But here's a big question in terms of what's overvalued, stocks or bonds. You have the largest short position in the volatility index. So if speculators believe the volatility in the stock market is going to stay low to the point they have record short positions. Now, when this gets unwound up to them being in the plus, that means stock prices go down when volatility goes up. And when the more people that pile into these short positions, it does not take very much, just a spark of a match sometimes to set off an unwind of short covering as these speculators are forced to buy volatility to cover their short positions. And when you find out on days like today where mutual fund managers have virtually no cash, they have just drained down the cash to buy stocks and you're hearing all these people chasing the market, it sets up a potential move on no news. All it would just take is just the ball to get rolling down the hill and it would just force selling after selling. So again, you still, you look at the stock market, you know, near record, at record highs, short, huge short volatility position, no cash in the markets. So you see good bonds not far from their record highs, but only disinflationary data to come. Further contracting of industrial production, lower crude oil prices, all these things are great for bonds. So it kind of tells you uh, the one to be in would be the bond market. So uh, let's also take a quick look at the NASDAQ McClellan summation index. Of course, we would expect uh, that to push a little higher here. And let's go and do a quick look at the last 90 days. And uh, let's see, this here is treasury yields, 10-year treasury yields in the blue, or blue, in the green and red. And in purple is the largest S&P 500 ETF, symbol SPY. And you can see that now zooming out, big divergence. One of these two gaps is either the gap is going to close higher with interest rates going up or stock prices coming down. One of the two things is going to happen. But in the last 90 days, you can see they're fairly well in sync. And this is normally where they should be long term. So there's a gap here. What happened is stock market is trying to grind higher and push treasury yields up. But unfortunately, the data keep for the stock investors keep saying the same thing. And that is there isn't any inflationary data. But you have a lot of speculative positions here that have driven this up. And you had some selling and you had a lot of selling of quant computers, which will come back in as their as their price levels as the yields move down, they will hit price level um, yield levels to buy back in and they will do so. Now, the only bad thing about today is 
we have a new gap in yields. Now, whether this will be filled immediately or, or it will be filled in a later date, months, years down the road, I don't know. Uh, but there's one, two, uh, three, four, four, five gaps on the way down. So it still, still tells us there's a, a, a touch of the all-time low. We'll break the all-time low, yank the rug out of the market, and then come back up here. That could happen. Um, but all I know is on Friday, I've got some more re uh, some really cool that I wrote about, and I'm going to show you some graph based on the Treasury debt cycle via interest rates going down to the excessive government borrowing. I'm Steve Van Meter. I'll see you Friday. Bye now.